Good evening and welcome to this week's edition of Behind the Headlines. And in this programme tonight, we shall be unmasking Kamala Harris, the Vice President, and now because of last week's Democratic National Convention, she was officially endorsed as the Democratic presidential candidate to go against Trump on Tuesday the 5th of November to determine who will be America's next president. And in this programme, I'm joined by Robert Harris from Voice for Justice UK and a real expert and specialist in uh, US politics. Uh, Robert, uh, Robert, it's great to see you on the nice programme. Nice to be back. And it's good to see you as well. So just share your thoughts a little bit on, on what has been an, an incredibly dramatic um, US election political campaign so far. I mean, you, can write a, you could write a script for this one to be in a, a soap opera. The events that we've had over the last few months, um, Joe Biden dropping out, Kamala Harris popping in, Trump ahead in the polls, now losing in the polls. Um, oh, it's just extraordinary, isn't it? It's all very, very dramatic. And uh, of course, no one could have anticipated any of this. Uh, we're only just a little over two months away from the election day. Um, and I wonder, regardless of who is declared to be the winner, I don't think it's going to be very peaceful because the tensions in America and the divisions are so great, sadly, that it's not a very united country. I think we can all agree on that. No, absolutely. And of course, we have to, and this is the whole purpose of the programme today, is to really unmask who Kamala Harris is. I mean, she's gone from being a bit of a hapless vice president with, with the worst approval ratings for any vice president in American history to now uh, a, a democratic political superstar, as we saw that she was unveiled at the uh, Democratic National Convention uh, last week in Chicago, where it seems that all of the mainstream media are completely backing her. Of course, all the hierarchy within the Democrats uh, party absolutely love her. And uh, now she seems that she's got momentum. The Democrats felt that they were going to lose badly in this presidential election on Tuesday, the 5th of November. But her as the Democratic candidate has brought new life into the political campaign on the Democrats, wouldn't you say? It has. Uh there are lots of questions, though, that we don't have answers to, that we should have answers to in a democracy. Uh, we don't really know very much about what her policies are. And this is very worrying. If you go to her website, there isn't a single page devoted to what her policies are. Uh, she hasn't given a single interview in the last few weeks since she was informally chosen as the nominee for president. And since the convention, she hasn't given a single interview. This is very worrying and out of place in a democracy where Candidates are accountable to the people. They need to be tested before the people with uncomfortable questions. OK, there will be a debate shortly with Donald Trump, and that will be a testing time for both of them. Uh, but it is very worrying that she's not facing the questions from the press, um, not even the friendly press. So that raises lots of concerns, I think. And even if someone is a Democrat in America, they should be concerned about that. But also you could say the same thing that she has been unveiled as the presidential candidate at the Democratic National Convention without any challenges. So no one was allowed to challenge her. No one was able to actually have a democratic vote as we saw with the primaries so that she has that legitimacy on behalf of the Democratic Party. And it was like, you know, she's been imposed. This is our leader. This is our presidential candidate. We're pushing her and that's it. You have no choice. So it also smacks of a kind of uh, Soviet-esque style politics which has a huge democratic deficit attached to it. And the fact that she uses buzzwords and upbeat words that she feels that this is campaign, let's be happy and high impact and energy, which is really hiding not only her character flaws, but also her very extreme liberal progressive agenda, which most Americans, if they really knew who she was and what she represents, wouldn't actually vote for her on Tuesday, the 5th of November. You know, the party, the Democrat Party, makes a lot about the importance of democracy. Uh, a number of Democrat politicians talk about the fact that democracy is very sacred. Um, and that's all very well and good because democracy certainly is an essential component of our modern society. Um, without it, we are in serious danger. However, um, yeah, if you go back to 2020, she didn't get a single vote. She didn't get through even to the primaries. She didn't get any support then. She wasn't considered a successful candidate by any stretch of the imagination. And now, as you rightly point out, she hasn't... Well, Joe Biden received 14 million votes in the primaries. She didn't receive a single vote. 
so yeah, this raises lots of serious questions about the democracy of America and how people can be propelled into a position of influence and authority and potential power in the White House. And the people haven't had a say in that. Absolutely. So let's have a, a recap to find out where we are in terms of this uh, US presidential election race. So last week, uh, Kamala Harris was endorsed as the Democratic presidential candidate without facing a Democratic contest, nor has she given, as uh, Robert's rightly said, a press conference or an interview regarding her credentials for America's top job. Uh, Kamala Harris has gone from being a failed vice president with the worst approval ratings in American history uh, to being transformed into a political superstar and has re-engaged the Democratic base and is now head uh, in the polls uh, for the forthcoming presidential election in November. Uh, the danger is that Kamala Harris and her election team are using uh, buzzwords uh, that mean absolutely nothing uh, and nor she outlined her policy position for government in order to conceal her dangerous liberal agenda if she becomes president and becomes the 47th president uh, of America. Uh, the issue of abortion has been the focal point of her election campaign and according to the Sunday Times they say policy wise genitals are the top of the agenda. Ho ho it's abortion city meaning Chicago. Madam Prosecutor has made clear that she will write Roe versus Wade into law the moment she gets into the White House. She has uh, spoken of herself being woke and wanting more woke policies, plus endorsing extreme liberal progressive agenda uh, and surrounding herself with uh, LGBT activists at the DNC. On Israel, the uh, vice president has been very hostile to Israel's security situation, but has been repositioning herself in order to try and make herself look pro-Israel. And we see that Donald Trump has been completely wrong-footed by her emergence because he thought he was going after Biden. And we also see, for example, that Kamala Harris is adopting a very similar political strategy of that of Keir Starmer. In other words, let's be vague, let's not give any detailed policy positions, let's hide our true intention for government because we don't want to scare the voters and once we're in power we can do what we like. Um, and then finally uh, we're seeing that so much is at stake uh, in this presidential election, not only for the United States but also for the free world and maybe if Kamala Harris wins the presidency in November it could be lights out for the Western world in terms of our democratic freedom, uh, our, our democracy and our way of life. I suspect a lot of the people who are voting for her, and by the way, this can be said of any politician, uh, it's a protest vote. They just don't want Donald Trump, but they're not necessarily impressed with what she's got to offer. And we see, for example, um, Biden was looking extremely frail. And of course, then that meant that the presidential election campaign on the on, on behalf of the Democrats was very slow, was very cumbersome. Um, Americans were kind of embarrassed that uh, Joe Biden is their presidency, was going to be their presidential candidate in November's election uh, to go into another four years. But what uh, him stepping down and more like him being forced to step down and pushing Kamala Harris right into the spotlight as also means it's changed the dynamics of this campaign. And if we look back to where we were uh, only, only back in June, so on the 27th of June, we had the disastrous presidential election debate with Joe Biden doing badly, which then led calls for him to be replaced. Then Kamala Harris has been replaced. We also saw before that the assassin attempted assassination on Donald Trump, uh, which he survived, uh, which gave him an incredible momentum in the, uh, in the polling. Um, but since Harris has come on the scene, we're seeing this is a completely different battle that he's fighting than the one against Biden. Isn't it interesting, though, because for the last three and a half years, the American press have, as far as I can see, they've been protecting Biden. They haven't been subjecting him to the normal scrutiny that you would expect. Um, and there's this concept, which I think is outdated, that you have a free press. That means, usually, that the government does not interfere with the press in terms of what they write. Now, in one sense, that's true, although we can look at how Twitter was manipulated. That's a separate strand. They don't interfere generally. OK, I get that. However, their ideology is so biased and they don't even pretend to hide it. They don't try to hide it. They've been protecting him. And I think we're seeing something similar with Kamala. 
She's being protected. She's not being subjected to the kind of scrutiny that you expect of every politician, of every kind of party, of every stripe and persuasion. She's not, she's not being subjected to that at all, is she? No, not at all which is very dangerous for democracy because we want to know who the real, real Kamala Harris is. We, uh, as you said, it's important. The role of journalism is to protect democracy, um, is to ask difficult questions um, to those in power and to scrutinise those in power to make sure that they are governing in the best interests of the nation. That's what democracy is about. That's what uh, journalists are. They are the guardians of democracy. Now, if the journalists are not asking the important questions or being allowed to ask the important questions of, the, of these two presidential candidates, in this case, uh, Kamala Harris, then that's very dangerous because we want to know who she is, um, particularly if you're an American and you're voting on Tuesday the 9th of November. You want to know what policies she's representing. You want to know if she's in the White House, what it will mean uh, for the American economy. What would this mean in terms of uh, US foreign policy on the world stage? Uh, how America interacts with other nations? Uh, and also, for example, are you going to guarantee kind of freedom? Um, in this case, we're talking biblical freedom, um, as we see that uh, she represents the most extreme liberal progressive agenda of any US senator while she was in the Senate before she became vice president, which means that it's so important to understand what her agenda is, what her plan for government is, rather than using happy buzzwords and, uh, you know, let's, let's not turn back is one of her big buzzwords or let's defend, uh, you know, reproduction rights. And that's it without any more context saying how she's going to deliver those things is incredibly dangerous for democracy. You know, when Obama became president, it was said by those on the right in America, he was the most liberal left-wing president America has had. When Biden arrived, they said he was the most left-wing president. I think if Kamala becomes the next president, she will be even more far to the left. Um, and, I, and I can't help but feel, although I don't have direct evidence of this, that she, in her uh, role as vice president, uh, she advises the president, among other things, she has been feeding in her left-wing ideology into executive decisions. Uh, I think that's almost inevitable that that's going to happen. Um, and I think he's listened to her. You only have to look at some of his policies and his uh, postures, his political posturing. You know, for instance, uh, the last Good Friday that we had uh, was um, signed into law as Transgender Visibility Day by President Biden. Now, that was no mistake. That was a deliberate attempt to change the calendar, the Christian calendar. Um, OK, America's not a theocracy, but it's largely a Christian culture. That's not, we, can't, we can't deny that. We can't deny that. And that was a deliberate attempt to choose that very, very holy day and to recalibrate it into something that fits in with modern, woke, extremist ideology. Yeah, and, and that is why the liberal progressive wing of the Democratic Party is so happy that she is their nominee for president come November because she represents the liberal progressive wing. And we're going she to see a lot more of that in a Kamala Harris presidency. Absolutely. I think you can be sure of that. So the big question is, who is Kamala Harris? So I'll just give you a little bit of information. So according to the White House official website, uh, they described Kamala Harris in the following way. Kamala D. Harris is the vice president of the United States. She says she always fights for the people from her barrier breaking time as the district attorney of San Francisco and the attorney general of California to proudly serving as the US uh, state's senator and the vice president. So Vice President Harris was born in Oakland, California on the 20th of October 1964. As the daughter of immigrants, she grew up surrounded by a diverse community and a loving extended family. Uh, she and her sister Maya were inspired by her mother, um, Shamala Gopalan, a breast cancer scientist and a pioneer in her own right who came to the United States from India at the age of 19, then received her doctorate the same year that uh, Kamala Harris was born. So, I mean, she's already, she comes from a highly politicised family. Her father is Jamaican who actually advised the uh, Jamaican government on uh, kind of extreme Marxist economics. He's known to have uh, communist credentials and a Marxist in, uh, in his understanding and in his teaching. Surely that would have had a huge impact on Kamala Harris growing up. 
he was an academic in, at uh, Stanford University, and as you say, Marxist economics was his thing. It's, it's questionable how much direct influence he had on her uh, because the, 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 her parents broke up when she was quite young, but I can't help but feel that Marxist perspective has played into her own thinking from her father. And, you know, she's on record for saying a number of things that clearly are from the communist playbook. So, for instance, she talks about the fact that she doesn't favour equality. Sounds a shock horror thing to say. Instead, she favours equity. And she defines equity, and this, is, this has been questioned whether it's even accurate to speak in these terms. It's about everyone arriving at the same place, getting the same outcome. Now, that has been understood economically, certainly by those on the right, to mean, OK, I, for instance, I put in 20 hours a week into my business. My fruits are very small. I don't get very much money at the end of the month. You put in 65 hours, you get a huge amount more than I do financially. But actually, that's unfair. Regardless of how many hours you put in, or more, maybe you're more talented than me, I should get the same as you. We all need to have the same outcomes. Uh, so this is, this is anti-meritocracy, really. This is, this is not good news. Um, and I think she is taking this from the communist playbook, although she may not ident she probably doesn't identify consciously as a communist. Many of those on the left don't, but they don't realise it. They are the heirs of Marx in many respects. And I mean, I mean, can you imagine previous presidents like Nixon being absolutely outraged that, uh, for example, that the presidential candidate, uh, as father, was a, a Marxist and held Marxist beliefs and is now potentially on the verge of winning the White House on uh, Tuesday the 5th of November. Uh, we had all the um, movement in the 1950s known as the kind of Red Scare, the McCarthyism era, and anyone with any hint of kind of Soviet influence or Marxist ideology were absolutely hounded out of public life. Um, and here we are, we're almost gone full circle now where the Democrats are embracing this kind of uh, ideology which fits in with a globalist agenda. Uh, and back in the, um, going back to four years ago for the last uh, US presidential election, uh, when um, Biden actually was picked Kamala Harris, I thought this is an interesting pick for vice president, primarily because she is the most liberal progressive senator in, uh, in America's history, uh, and I think she, she dwarfs that of President Obama. I thought it's only going to be a question of time, probably midway through uh, this uh, presidency of Joe Biden, that they will replace Biden with her. And of course, what happened is that he did better than the Democrats thought he would for the uh, midterm elections for Congress and the Senate, um, and in congressional elections, which meant that they had to keep Biden in place. But it seems like she was their cho uh, choice of candidate ever since. But the question is, her rec track record as vice president was, was, was shocking. She's been absent on everything. She's supposed to be the border czar, and yet she's allowed millions more immigrants to come through in the South. Um, she probably hasn't been kind of absent uh, and, and doing an effective role as vice president with appalling uh, uh, approval ratings. And yet now she's been trumped as a, a political superstar by the Democrats. Now, either she is or she isn't. It's interesting, isn't it? Because they often say, not just to Kamala Harris, of all politicians, when they're standing for office, they say, oh, this person has a lot of experience. Let's just unpack that statement for a few moments. If I'm going for a job, an ordinary job with a company, I submit my CV with all my experience, is that enough that I say, this is my experience, and then I expect to get employed? That's not the way it works. I need to be interviewed. I need to be scrutinized. I need to be questioned about what I've learned from that experience. So in the case of a politician, it's fine to say they've got all this experience. Fine, we can't deny that. But what about their judgment? What have they learned from their experience? Experience alone doesn't count for anything. It's what you've learned from it. It's what your judgment is following that experience in difficult situations and, of course, what that person's ideology is. So let's not just bang on about experience because, yes, she's got the experience. She definitely ticks all those boxes, absolutely no question. But let's, let's, wait, and see, let's wait and see her be interviewed, if she's going to be interviewed. And I think it's an act of humility for any politician to be interviewed. Virtually every politician gets interviewed. I don't know why she's refusing to be interviewed. I, I suspect it's because, well, she hasn't been very good in her performance with interviews. 
I think she struggled to articulate some of her policy positions, and some have said she doesn't have any policy positions on certain key issues. So that is not good for somebody who wants to occupy the highest office in the land. Absolutely. So let's go and see. So in 2017, she was sworn into the United States Senate. Uh, where she championed legislation to fight hunger, provide rent relief, improve mental health care, expanded access to capital for small businesses, revitalise America's infrastructure and combat the uh, climate crisis. Um, said that she questioned two Supreme Court nominees uh, while serving on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, she also worked to keep the American people safe from foreign threats, that could be questioned, and uh, crafted a bipartisan legislation to assist in securing American elections while serving on the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence. So back in 2010, she, Vice President Harris, was elected as the Attorney General of California, where she oversaw the largest state uh, justice department in the country. She took on those who are preying on the American people and claims that uh, she's winning a $20 billion settlement for California Californians whose homes had been foreclosed and a $1.1 billion settlement for students and veterans who were taken advantage of, but wait there, uh, by uh, for non-profit education company. She also defended the Affordable Care Act and before that she was the district attorney of San Francisco where she said that uh, she was a massive supporter of the LGBTQ and rights uh, and she has officiated the first same-sex wedding after Proposition 8 was overturned. She was also established the office's Environmental Justice Unit and created groundbreaking program to provide first-time drug offenders with the opportunity to earn a high uh, school degree and find employment. And um, we've got this little video to show you now. And uh, this is actually produced by Living Waters, uh, Ray Comfort's video. And this is Kamala Harris pretending to be a Christian. Kamala Harris says she's a Christian. To really be true to the teachings of Christ, one must think of our faith as a verb. Do you believe her? No. Oh, I don't know why I shouldn't. I don't know. No, because I don't see fruit. Jesus is telling us then about, yes, we must love thy neighbor, but let's define and be clear about who is our neighbor. No. Probably not. Oh, absolutely not. No, I think she's the exact opposite. I don't believe anything that comes out of her mouth. Whatever she says with her mouth, her actions betray that. I don't think that she practices. I just think if she is a Christian, it's a name only for votes. She's uh, pro-abortion. And so when we think about justice, let's also remember all the prophets spoke about justice. They spoke about it, Proverbs 31.9, speak up for the poor and the helpless and see that they get justice. And when Congress passes a law to restore reproductive freedoms as President of the United States, I will sign it into law. Three bills signed into Minnesota law. One is long, they're all long, long overdue. One of them protects people seeking or providing abortions. We are witnessing a full-on attack against hard-fought, hard-won freedoms and rights. Take reproductive freedom. Well, Tim and I have a message for Trump and others who want to turn back the clock on our fundamental freedoms. We're not going back. And so let me say about Tim Waltz, he has shown up to stand against these attacks long before he stood on the stage with me. After Roe was overturned, he was the first governor in the country to sign a new law that enshrined reproductive freedom as a fundamental right. She's pro uh, all the transgender stuff. You know, we have to stay woke. Like, everybody needs to be woke. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can talk about if you're the wokest or woker, but just stay more woke than less woke. 
That's a little bit of an insight into who uh, Kamala Harris is. Now, what is very disturbing, I think, is the fact that she could become America's 47th president on Tuesday, the 5th of November. Uh, considering that she embraces wokeness, we, we see her uh, agenda pushing the LGBT agenda, but also her issue on abortion. And it's the issue of abortion that she seems to care about more than any other. And the fact is that uh, she wants to, if she, the first thing she said if she becomes president is to make Roe v. Wade, that ruling that uh, made federalized um, abortion right across America uh, and made it um, all across the United States, which was overturned during uh, uh, Trump's presidency uh, through his appointment of um, Barrett to the Supreme Court and having majority in the Supreme Court, he's then allowed the, f the, the, what, the, the, the actual states of America to actually decide whether to adopt abortion or not. And of course, she wants to bring this back under federal law and make it um, a, a, a criminal offence if you oppose pro-life. So I think that does show her where her heart is and what she's concerned about. I think Trump's position here is that it's a decision for the states so under his uh, first term as president, uh, he was considered very, very pro-life. Um, since he's left office, he's become very slightly open to a more liberal perspective. He's still very pro-life, but he's emphasising the fact that he believes in the three exceptions. And he always cites Ronald Reagan's name when he cites those three exceptions. Ronald Reagan supported uh, exceptions, uh, rape, incest and life of the mother. Um, so I think by stressing those exceptions, he's appealing to those who are somewhere in the middle. I mean, I don't suppose there are many people who are right in the middle between those two extremes on abortion. But for those who are maybe a little undecided, he's trying to appeal to those more liberal minded voters who might otherwise yeah. support his policies. But, you know, it's interesting. The language that we get from the left, including the Democrat Party on abortion, is they call it reproductive rights. Now she's using the language of reproductive freedom. Well, maybe I'm missing something here, but the language of reproductive rights, uh, excuse me, abortion is not about reproductive rights. It's anti-reproductive rights. It's preventing conception or preventing a child from entering the world. How is that about reproductive freedom? Reproductive freedom, as I understand it, is about having the freedom to have children, to bring a child into the world. So it's very interesting how the left totally manipulates language to present a phrase to the, the viewer, which makes it sound so incredibly benign and so attractive, you can't possibly be, be against it. Yeah, but it also means that uh, this, this position that uh, Trump has made means that he's losing so much of the evangelical support to actually vote for him because this is an issue they all rally behind. But also he knows the consequences of how, for example, when Road v Wade was overturned back in 2022, how that galvanised the Democratic support base. And of course that meant that this prevented the Republicans from winning the Senate, um, which they won the Congress, but they lost the Senate. So Biden could claim a victory in the midterm elections uh, two years ago. So I think he's worried that if this issue is electrified and becomes um, the central issue for the Democrats, particularly for liberal women across the United States, they will vote uh, Democrat on, on this topic uh, and this issue. And that will then mean it was a lot more of an uphill struggle for the Republican Party, but at the same time, he kind of alienates that Christian vote when Christians are saying, look, we want you to ban abortion federally from the United States, not to allow individual states to make that decision whether to implement abortion or not, uh, but it would be done at a kind of want a federal ban of abortion. So we see that this is a huge topical issue, but it shows you how far American politics is compared to our politics. You can't even have this discussion in the House of Commons, uh, which was extraordinary. But uh, the um, Spectator has, um, has an excellent article under the headline, Can Kamala Harris Bluff Her Way to the White House? Uh, and uh, this is the following extracts. The story of the Democrats party's uh, 2024 election campaign, the first televised presidential debate in Atlanta, Georgia on the 27th of June, seems to have been an absolute disaster. President Joe Biden's clear and president, present feebleness uh, had been exposed for all the world to see. 
His opponent, Donald Trump, became the favorite to win back the White House. Then 16 late, days later, Trump survived an assassination attempt and his shock uh, stock rose even higher. So we're seeing that, uh, you know, the, the introduction of Kamala Harris has really regalvanized this election. But isn't it important, uh, you know, as we're doing this program today to scrutinize who she is, her track record, her policies, and what a Kamala Harris presidency would look like. Because it's important if you're going to vote, and we don't have the privilege of voting, but our, our viewers who are watching this on YouTube, our American viewers, have the opportunity to vote. Isn't it important that they gain as much information as they can about Kamala Harris, what the Democrats are planning, what, uh, what their plan is for government before they actually vote? Rather than saying, I don't like Trump, therefore I'm not going to vote in the US presidential elections, knowing that I don't like his personality. But the fact is that by not voting for Trump, we could end up having Kamala Harris in the White House. You know, it's very difficult because there's a fair amount of discussion in the last few weeks about Kamala Harris's record as a prosecutor. So she was district attorney. She was attorney general, the first woman attorney general in California. She was a senator and now she's vice president. Uh, so she's achieved many firsts in her life. Um, but there is a question about how that translates into what a presidency would look like. Um, so I think, I think we have to be very careful. Look, there are, those on, there are those who are her defenders who say she's got this wonderful track record. She acted with integrity as a prosecutor. She was a pioneer. There are those who are attacking her, saying she was a hypocrite, she wasn't a great prosecutor after all. Very difficult to rely on what journalists are saying. Who is telling the truth? I suspect there's truth on both sides in terms of her role as a prosecutor. But unless you actually look at those cases directly, which I haven't had the privilege of looking at yet, I can't, I'm going to defer judgment about what she has been as a prosecutor. Let's just, can we just uh, take a few moments to look at the role of vice president? Because I feel in these discussions, people often think, well, what does a vice president do? And I've been looking into this. Um, a vice president isn't just a ceremonial figure. They're not just waiting for, if, you know, God forbid, if something happens to the president, then they step in. It's more than that. They obviously deputize for the president in, in his or her absence. Uh, they chair cabinet meetings. They also chair important commissions for specialist causes. Uh, and also the role of vice president has actually evolved very importantly over the decades. So if you go back to the 1920s, Calvin Coolidge, who was first vice president, then he became president. Under President Harding, Calvin Coolidge was invited for the first time as a vice president to come to committee meeting, uh, uh, sorry, cabinet meetings. It wasn't done before. Um, under Franklin D. Roosevelt, Harry Truman had not shared with, uh, sorry, FDR had not shared with Harry Truman the fact that the Manhattan Project was being developed. He didn't even know anything about it until Harry Truman took office in April 45. He didn't know anything about it. And then fast forward to Jimmy Carter. Jimmy Carter, when he chose Walter Mondale as his vice presidential nominee, Mondale said, I will only accept this position on the condition that I can have access to all the documents that you've got access to. Because until that time, the vice president did not have access to every single document. And he said, look, as a lawyer, as an advisor to you as a potential future president, how can I give you the best advice if I haven't got access to the information that you've got? So this position has evolved significantly. So whether it's Kamala Harris or whether it's uh, Donald Trump, the, the, vice, the next vice president Tim Waltz or J.D. Vance, they are in a potentially very powerful position behind the scenes to advise, inform, warn, encourage the president. Uh, we don't get to see what happens behind closed doors, but that is a very important role. We shouldn't underestimate it. Yeah, I think you missed one, um, Dick Cheney. So in George W. Bush's uh, first term in office, and of course there's also that, that film called Vice, uh, which, um, and having met uh, some of the... Uh, White House presidential advisors to uh, uh, the, in the George W. administration, particularly advising Dick Cheney, and his, in the first term of the George W. Bush administration, he, he was virtually all powerful. He Absolutely. was virtually running the state. Um, we also saw, for example, with Trump's uh, vice president. Um, 
uh, we, we saw with him. Mike Pence, for example, he's the one that selected the uh, ministers of state. Um, he was also the one that got the, the, uh, the clogs of government moving. And he was a, a huge influential player in terms of influencing Trump. Maybe the only one that was probably pulling Trump back a little bit um, in terms of uh, Trump's uh, plans and ambitions and kept him in check. But we saw, for example, with Kamala Harris, that she's been absent these past three and a half years from that role. Well, it's interesting in America at the moment, uh, those on the right are saying she was the border czar. In fact, it was never denied until very recently by the Democrat Party. She was the border czar in all but name. Now they're saying she wasn't the border czar and therefore she didn't have responsibility for the millions of people who have come through the country. By the way, there's a, there's a clip uh, somewhere of her saying about, she talks about the people who are coming across the southern border and she gives somebody a name. I don't know if it's a fictional name or whether it's a real character and she's saying this mother with her child comes across the border she's hoping for a better life and the point of her message is why should we be condemning this person she's looking for a better life we should be welcoming her but then the question arises hold on a minute we can't just walk into a country beyond the legal period that we're allowed to stay there for if we want to settle there there's a legal way of doing it we're all for that. Look, America is built on immigrants. Without immigrants, America would be a very different country. They are very rich for all the immigrants they've got. But there's a legal process by which you enter the United States, as with any country. And only recently, since she is the nominee for president, now she's saying to those who are thinking of crossing the border illegally, don't, she says. Oh, that's interesting. That's the first time I've heard this warning in the last three and a half years. So far, it's been either encouragement or silence. Strange, yeah. isn't it? No, very much so. And, and that's why it's important to analyse who she is, analyse the potential policies that she will have and a plan for government. Because if she wins in November, that's a, a, a four years in power as a US president. Um, can, where, can, may I just say that there's, there's also this other problem. It's not just allowing uh, illegal immigrants in. A number of these people in Democrat states are being given free health care. Now, this is one step among, uh, as part of a larger process of enfranchising people who actually legally should not be in the country. And of course, those on the right are saying, well, this is all part of an attempt to get their vote. Now, it's difficult to imagine a different scenario. I mean, why, why would you allow people into the country who are not going through the legal process, give them much of the, many of the rights that full citizens have. Why, why would you do that for? Why would you do that? There has to be, it, it, it doesn't so two reasons. Right. I mean, firstly, two reasons. The same with uh, Peter Manderson's uh, ploy to allow mass immigration into the country when uh, Tony Blair was prime minister. That was to bolster the support uh, amongst the electorate for the Labour Party. And it's also another way for the globalists to break down the nation state, break down nation borders. Certainly there, part therefore, of it. if you have this massive uh, transfer, population transfer to the West, you break down the borders, you break down the cultures, you break down the identity of each nation, making it easier for nations then to fit into a global government or one world government, uh, and that's what they're pursuing. So no doubt, uh, back in 2016, um, the UN launched a charter in which they called for a world without borders. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you're an immigrant uh, living in Africa or the Middle East and you want a new life in the West, you're entitled to do so, but each country must provide details on the benefits of that country and what they hold. So I think this explains the kind of globalist agenda. And there's no doubt that when it comes to being a globalist that Kamala Harris is the biggest, far beyond that of uh, Joe Biden. And uh, it was almost like, for example, she's being groomed to be in this position, which means she's got the full support of the vast majority of the US uh, media who are turning her into a political superstar, uh, encouraging Americans to vote for her. She is 59. She is so much younger than Trump. So her campaign looks more energetic, more unbeat. And of course, anyone that looking at like Kamala Harris or Trump, I'll vote Harris without looking at her policies because her policies are never scrutinised. But we see also that last week that she was announced without 
one single vote or any primaries to become the Democrats uh, a, a presidential candidate at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago, which smacks of Soviet style politics. No vote, no say, no party members can have a say who their leader is, unless she's announced on, on stage, you know, uh, Biden replaced, Kamala Harris is in, no, a huge democratic deficit with, with her appointment to that uh, position to be America's next president. It doesn't say a lot for democracy, does it, in America? And you know, I think it's worth, it's, it, we should remind ourselves, democracy is not just about having the right to elect our representatives who make laws. Democracy is about free speech and its application. It's about the rule of law and its application. It's about transparency. It's about accountability. It's about consultation with the electorate. So I don't think they're scoring very many points at the moment by um, coronating her in this way without going through the due process. Absolutely. So let's have a look at this excellent CBN news report that uh, reported from last week's National Democratic Convention in Chicago, where Kamala Harris was announced as the Democrats' presidential candidate for Tuesday, the 5th of November. Democratic National Convention is off and running. Democrats riding high on momentum. Good evening, everyone! <laughs> as they'll officially nominate Vice President Kamala Harris as their party's standard bearer. Good evening, good evening! Harris making a surprise appearance on stage. The night's theme, For the People. It's headline speaker, President Joe Biden, who was welcomed by a four-minute standing ovation. I love you. Just one month after dropping out of the race, Biden defended his term in office and made the case for why he thinks Harris is better than former President Trump. She'll be a president we can all be proud of. And she will be an historic president who puts her stamp on America's future. Former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton also took the stage. It still takes a village to raise a family, heal a country, and win a campaign. Outside the convention, thousands of mostly peaceful pro-Palestinian protesters marched in Chicago, though some broke down a security barrier outside the hall. And inside held up this sign, Stop Arming Israel. Tonight, former President Obama and Michelle Obama will speak. Tomorrow, we'll hear from Governor Tim Walz. And then on Thursday, Harris is expected to formally accept her party's nomination. And this November, we will come together and declare with one voice, as one people, we are moving forward. But this was her message last night. Harris bringing fresh energy to the party and making clear it's a new race for Democrats. Jenna Browder, CBN News. With Joe Biden pushed to the sidelines, Kamala Harris had the stage all to herself. Since becoming the nominee, she has energized Democrats. Last night, she took the opportunity to reach beyond her own party. There are people of various political views watching tonight. And I want you to know, I promise to be a president for all Americans. You can always trust me to put country above party and self. Despite being vice president for three and a half years, her narrative hasn't been fully cemented. One third of voters don't really know much about what she stands for. In her mission to define it, she highlighted her career as a federal prosecutor. Every day in the courtroom, I stood proudly before a judge and I said five words, Kamala Harris for the people. She told a story of a middle class girl who is now fighting for the little guy. Meanwhile, her opponent wants voters to see something entirely different. Comrade Kamala Harris, she, I call her comrade because she is a radical left Marxist. Harris also had a few choice words for Donald Trump. She spent large portions of her speech attacking him. Donald Trump is an unserious man. <laughs> but the consequences, but the consequences of putting Donald Trump, 
back in the White House are extremely serious. But what about seriousness of policy? Her recent economic proposal of price controls to bring down inflation went over poorly, even with liberal analysts. Thursday evening, she continued to be relatively vague. We will create what I call an opportunity economy, an opportunity economy where everyone has the chance to compete and a chance to succeed. On the Israel-Hamas war, a political situation that could cause her headaches with the far left of her party this fall, she carefully tried to navigate. I will always stand up for Israel's right to defend itself. President Biden and I are working to end this war such that Israel is secure, the hostages are released, the suffering in Gaza ends, and the Palestinian people can realize their right to dignity, security, freedom, and self-determination. It remains to be seen how detail-oriented she handles that issue and others as the campaign moves on. So far, she's been riding the momentum of positive vibes and party enthusiasm the next chapter could be a heavier lift. Harris has to convince independent voters that she is the right candidate for the next four years. She, uh, she carries some of the burden of the past administration, but she also needs to uh, show that she is on her, can stand on her own and know that, and, and voters trust that she's going to be better than Trump for the next four years. That was uh, Kamala Harris uh, last week at the DNC in uh, Chicago being announced as the Democratic presidential candidate uh, for November's presidential election. Uh, I mean, what is interesting, isn't it? I mean, I, I, I watched her speech and I was quite surprised because it was very emotive. I, I thought that she spoke very well. Um, and of course, you know, we're going to see now that the liberal media in the States are just going to rally behind her, as you say, without asking the serious questions that need to be asked of what kind of president she will be, what is her agenda. Uh, but the fact is that we know that she absolutely embraces herself with the whole LGBT agenda, that she embraces herself on the issue of um, being uh, uh, supporting abortion and making that almost her focal point of a presidential election campaign uh, means that she's really odds with uh, with what the Bible teaches on morality and morality issues. Uh, therefore, we know, for example, the progressive liberals uh, have influenced politicians over the last couple of decades to an extent this is where we are seeing the persecution, the attacks coming against Christians. Um, she is 100% a globalist. Now, whether she believes in free market economics, whether she believes in capitalism, I think is doubtful, um, which would be very dangerous for America's future, not only economically, but also spiritually. But also we have to address her kind of policy on, on Israel. So from October, when October the 7th started, the biggest mass terrorist attack uh, in Israel's history, comparable to that of the Holocaust over 80 years ago, Kamala Harris has been a uh, a very strong opponent against Israel's military operation in Gaza. We, we see that she's changed her tack a little bit uh, in order to say that we would de defend Israel in order to win over uh, Jewish Democrats to vote for her. Uh, and the fact her husband is Jewish as well, she thinks she can win the Jewish vote come November's election. But also the fact she talks so passionately about defending the uh, Palestinian cause and calling for Palestinian self-determination when we know that that will mean effectively another Islamist terrorist state on Israel's doorstep in the Middle East. She has no regard for the uh, true implementation of democracy and democratic institutions and this would be another covert support for Islamists and, and terrorism and therefore she represents that uh, red-green alliance of the hard left together with the Islamists who are now making up a core component of, of the Democratic Party, very much like the Labour Party here, uh, which does not bode well for the future of the United States nor the free world. That's my opinion. You mentioned Israel. Let's just say a few words about Iran. Of course. Uh, what will be her approach to Iran on the international stage? Well, I think we've got some possible clues by looking at the Biden presidency. Biden released billions of dollars to Iran. 
Uh, now, in their defence, the Biden administration said that that money could not go towards uh, any foul play. It couldn't go towards terrorist uh, goals. It was specifically for legitimate ends. There is a dispute as to whether that could be subject to the right kind of scrutiny and whether that actually happened. But regardless, even if it went to the right ends and it didn't go towards terrorist objectives, I think it's fair to say that it is emboldening Iran by um, suspending, only, if only temporarily, the, uh, the sanctions, the financial sanctions. And, uh, well, of course, Donald Trump has exploited that and he said if he were president, October the 7th wouldn't have happened. It wouldn't have happened. Now, I don't know if that's actually true or not. It's difficult to assess what would have happened if he had been president. But I think it's very dangerous if Iran is being emboldened this way. And I don't know what her position is because she hasn't told us. She hasn't told us. All we know is that it's probably, uh, this is my judgment, that she's going to be more of Biden, more, but more left wing. On the Israel thing, just a few other points. In, in some regards, she has been very pro-Israel in her statements. And I think in, a, in her own conflicted way, she is pro-Israel. She, she's got a Jewish husband. She's got a lot of support and close relationships with the Jewish constituencies within the Democrat Party. That's all, that's all fine. But she's also uh, arguably criticised Israel in ways that are very illegitimate and unfounded. So she talks about the unnecessary uh, numbers of innocent people who have died. So the implication there is Israel could have avoided those deaths. There's a further implication or a suggestion that they did it carelessly or deliberately, because that's what a lot of these pro-Palestine demonstrators are insinuating. Israel is deliberately killing Palestinians. They don't care. But, that, but where's the evidence for that? They are in an existential uh, situation for the survival of their country. And, you know, and I, th I think it spoke volumes that uh, when the Israeli Prime Minister addressed uh, Congress a couple of months ago, back in June, she wasn't anywhere to be seen. It was very convenient that and she then had another afterwards, appointment. she met with uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. Yeah. She, um, she, uh, she spoke of uh, America's need and the Democrats' need to support Israel. But at the same time, that, uh, that speech was packed with lots of punches against Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, uh, effectively calling for an immediate ceasefire. And now, we know that uh, Biden it kind of flip-flops his position on Israel like he does on abortion, um, but he has been a long-standing advocate for the state of Israel ever since he became a kind of senator in the 70s. So uh, we know that under Kamala Harris, the relationship between Israel and the United States will be extremely difficult, if not more difficult than that of the Obama administration. But what was also the worrying sign is you always judge a person by the friends that they keep. So the fact is that Bernie Sanders, the most extreme left wing politician in America's history, is calling for Kamala Harris uh, to be America's next president and is rallying behind her. The likes of uh, uh, Congresswoman Cortez and others that represent the extreme pro-Palestinian Islamist cause are also supporting her as well, indicates, I think, the direction that she will take America under her pr uh, presidency, which will be a globalist government. Uh, it will be uh, a pro-liberal progressive government that will crack down on Bible-believing Christians and anyone who doesn't support or advocate her views. We've already seen with the Democratic uh, National Convention, there were no democratic procedures in place, so they don't regard democracy. They don't care anything much about the free press, otherwise uh, she would have given an interview or a press conference when she became announced as the presidential candidate. And the fact that Biden is still president means that they're not taking this situation seriously because if he is not fit enough to run uh, and to compete for the presidential election in November, then he's not fit enough either to be president. So in actual fact, she should be uh, sworn in as America's 47th president now because clearly Biden is not fit enough. And of course, these are all the lies that are coming up. And, uh, you know, we will see a lot of dirty tactics come November. But the big question is, I think, in the dying moments of the program, we have to ask, uh, Robert, is how does Donald Trump respond to this new challenger? He's already said he's concerned about having a TV debate with her. Uh, of course, that will make him look bad. He already looks old in comparison to her. And he's lost, seems like he's lost that political momentum. Um, how does he respond to Kamala Harris? 
Well, he's got a new star to present at his rallies, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., whose father was the assassinated senator, whose uncle was John F. Kennedy. And this is a very unexpected alliance. Kennedy is calling it uh, a kind of coalition. Uh, so it's interesting to see how that translates into, translates into new support for Trump from the Kennedy wing. Which would be very interesting as well, because there's no doubt that Trump faces such a different battle than the one he faced uh, against uh, Joe Biden in November. And the fact is the whole of the American left-wing media or the mainstream media would be predominantly behind Kamala Harris is also uh, a disadvantage for, for Trump. But do you think he can get his message out? We know, for example, that she is pro-climate change, which will put off voters in Pennsylvania, which is one of those key states that she has to win if she wants to win the presidency. It looks like uh, Trump will win Florida because of the Hispanic vote. And it looks like he probably could win Pennsylvania. Of course, then Georgia becomes such an important issue. It looks like he could have lost Arizona because of his uh, treatment to, um, to uh, Senator John McCain. So they probably end up voting for Kamala Harris. So. It's all to play for, isn't it, come November? There are about 10 states that are considered swing states, and it's interesting, it's those 10 states where RFK Jr. has stood down. Um, and as I say, the Democrats are getting worried about that. The Republicans are seeing it as a big win. We have to wait and see what happens. Absolutely. Uh, and this is why it's important that we pray, isn't it? Um, particularly for our American viewers watching um, behind the headlines tonight, that you pray, you intercede, you know what we're up against. Because the danger is that, uh, that uh, conservative Christians could make the mistake made by uh, Christians in this country by voting for reform, uh, not voting for the Conservative Party, that effectively has allowed Keir Starmer an unprecedented a uh, majority in Parliament to pursue his agenda. And the same thing could happen because people dislike Trump's personality and who he represents could mean that this opens the door to Kamala Harris winning the presidency. I think, you know, all our decisions have consequences and ma many decisions are not ideal, but the Americans have to decide who they want as their next president. Excellent. Done a great job, Robert, on uh, Behind the Headlines. Thank you so thank much you. for being uh, my co-host for the programme. And I want to thank you for watching this programme at home. We need to unmask Kamala Harris. We need to know who she is. We need to know what she represents and what movements that she pushes. And we know it's very clear that she put, supports the liberal progressive agenda. She uh, supports abortion. She is hostile to Israel. That doesn't make the great characteristics needed to be American president and not only lead America, but to lead the free world in the fight against evil. So I want to thank you for watching tonight's Behind the Headlines. So continue to pray regarding this presidential election. So it's a shalom and God bless from us.